Um, so thank you everyone for coming to this talk in the last session of the last day. Um, so my lab um, at Mount Holyoke, um, uh, we do all uh, our work with undergraduate students and these are my amazing undergrads. And the work that I'm gonna be talking about today was led by Valeria Serna Solis who graduated last year. Um, and um, uh, in my lab we actually study um, uh, genitalia and um, we particularly study weird genitalia because I think that that's uh, where a lot of the fun is when you're looking at evolutionary structures. And this project actually started because of clickbait, this story that um, is, there's that screenshot in there that said that there was a, a, a fish with a penis on its head. And when I saw it, I was like, there's no way, like these people are lying. Um, and it is actually really not true, okay? So you should know there's, these guys do not have a penis on their head. What they have is a, a cool grasping structure that um, led us to start looking a little bit more in depth at what it was. Um, but ratfish are super cool. Uh, they uh, leave a depth and they look like they were put together with spare parts, which is always fun. Um, and so we decided to actually have a look at the spotted ratfish. Uh, they are very abundant in the west coast of the US. Um, they um, are cousins to the sharks, so they're cartilaginous fish. And uh, their copulatory behavior has been described from a single observation in an aquarium. Um, where they uh, watch this fish mate. And then uh, my very talented postdoc, Rachel, made a nice illustration of what this actually looks like. So the males have three different copulatory structures shown there in the red. They have a frontal tenaculum, that's what the not penis in the head structure, um, that they actually use to hook onto the anterior margin of the female pectoral fin. They also have a, pe a pair pre-pelvic tenacula that are in the uh, front of their pelvic fins, and they use those to hook onto the anterior edge of the female pelvic fin, and then they have a pair of intromittent claspers. Um, now, um, uh, what is really cool about this is that uh, actually vertebrates in general do not have a specialized grasping structures, and so this gives us a real opportunity to look at modularity and integration in genitalia that allow us to actually think about testing some evolutionary hypotheses for genital diversity. Um, uh, but in this, in this sense, they're a little bit more like an insect, right? And so we have very two distinct modules. So we have a uh, grasping module, which is basically made from this frontal tenaculum and this pre-pelvic tenaculum. Um, and then there is also, of course, the intromittent module, which is made by the claspers. Um, and one of the things that's um, interesting here is that if um, function is more important than development, then we would expect these grasping structures to actually be more tightly integrated with one another. Um, and uh, conversely, if development is more important, then we should actually see that the um, pair uh, pre-pelvic tenacula would be more integrated with the pair claspers because they're both in the pelvic fin of the fish. Uh, and what I'm showing you here, that illustration is, is showing you the, the, the cartilaginous structure of the pelvic fin. And um, there is the, um, uh, the pelvic girdle, which is the long pointy bone that is directly attached to the prepelvic tenacula. So I'll show you um, what these structures actually look like. So um, this is the frontal tenaculum right on top of the head. Um, this is a photo taken directly from the front of the fish. You can see the difference between a juvenile and an adult uh, in, the, in the shape and morphology of this uh, frontal tenaculum. This is what the uh, adult frontal tenaculum looks like from a 3D model that we made. You can see that at the base there is a large muscle. They have this bulbous tip and that tip is covered with spines. Uh, whereas if we look at the juveniles, this is what the juvenile tenacula looks like. So it's very flat, it's not curvy, it doesn't have the bulbous tip, doesn't have any spines. Um, now the uh, intromittent claspers in um, chimeras are actually um, they have an internal cartilaginous support that's divided into branches that end in a fleshy, uh, very speculated uh, lobe. Um, and these are actually inflatable, unlike, for example, the claspers of sharks, which are not inflatable. In sharks, the claspers just stop and these guys actually inflate. We don't even know what they inflate with, but they do. Um, and uh, if you look at the male, the adult male, these are what the claspers look like with that fleshy lobe in the end. Um, but if you look at the juvenile up on the top, uh, you can see that the juveniles actually entirely lack those extensions and the fleshy lobe in the end. Um, and then one more, the prepelvic tenacula. Um, as I mentioned, they uh, are there to hold on to the female as well, and they have this 
uh, blade-like, uh, spatula-like structure um, that actually opens up, and that's the part that the males are hooking over the female, and then you can see the long, pointy end of that um, pelvic girdle. So, choo -choo -choo. so our research questions had to do with three uh, different um, issues. First one is we wanted to understand the evolution of shape and look at what are the factors that are correlated with the shape of these three different structures in the ratfish. We also wanted to look at the allometry pattern, um, and we also wanted to look at the integration pattern. And I'm going to explain these as I go along. Uh, but I want to tell you briefly about the methods, and in about 30 seconds, I'm going to summarize hours and hours and hours and hours of work in the lab, mostly by my undergrads. Uh, but basically, we dissected a bunch of fish, adults, and juveniles. Um, we inflate those claspers. We dissect out the frontal tenacula, the, clean out the, the prepelvic um, tenacula as well, clear them out. And then we either do 3D models uh, using uh, laser or photogrammetry or CT scanning, depending on the size. Um, and then we use automated landmarking using Auto 3D GM that puts on about 3,000 landmarks in each of the structures. And then we put them uh, through R, and then we use R to do our analysis. All right, and so for the shape analysis, the question was, does the shape of the frontal tenaculum, intromitent claspers, and prepelvic tenaculum change with body size, centroid size, and or testis size? And we look ontogenetically, so putting all the specimens together and within each classes, so separately for juveniles and adults. And our results are going to look exactly the same for each one of these structures, which was one of our first surprises, actually. So ontogenetically, you can see this is a PC plot of the morphous base of the shape. You can see on the left side, all of those red dots are the adult individuals, and on the left side, the juvenile individuals, and you can see these clouds. The purple and the green represent the shapes of what those structures are like, and you can see that as the males become adult, those frontal tenacula become curvy, they acquire that bulbous head shape, and they have all the spines, and then the muscle at the base also gets bigger. But when we look uh, separately at the juveniles and the adults, we find a lot of variation in shape, um, but that variation in shape is not associated at all with any of the things we measure. So it's not associated with body size, centroid size, testis size, nothing. Um, and that's very weird because we typically do find that uh, these, these things matter when you're looking at genitalia. Uh, for the prepelvic tenacula, the exact same pattern. In this case, you can see that the adults, um, the difference is that they're growing, that, that um, uh, part of the prepelvic tenaculum is becoming broader, and it's opening up so that the males can actually use it to hook onto the females. Um, uh, but again, if we look at juveniles or adults, we find absolutely nothing. Um, when we look at the intromitant claspers, same thing. Intromitant claspers, they have the long uh, bifurcated um, structures at the end with the, with the fleshy lobes. Uh, but for the juveniles, they uh, just have the base of the, of the clasper and nothing else. And then once more, within juveniles, we find differences in shape, but um, not explained by any of the things that we measured. So um, in conclusion then for the shape, um, the shape varies significantly between juveniles and adults in ways that suggest functionality. But the variation within juveniles and within adults is not associated with body size, testis size, or centroid size. So this is very weird, right? And in some ways, um, we started to think here that these guys are a little bit more like insects and a little bit less like vertebrates. And uh, this uh, hunch was really confirmed when we actually look at the pattern of allometry. So we look at allometry in genitalia because, um, uh, you know, uh, there been, there's been a lot of work, particularly in insects, that suggests, for example, that positive allometry is often found in uh, species where there is sexual selection. The negative allometry is, uh, for example, a strategy known as a one size fits all, where the males are growing to fit the average female in the population. And isometry is kind of like the general expectation for morphological structures, that the structure is growing at the rate that the body size is increasing. So we usually find, uh, you know, some, some of these allometric patterns. So in this particular case, same thing, the, the data on this slide is going to look exactly the same for all three structures. So I'll walk you through this one, and then I'll go quickly through the others. Uh, but what you can see here, this is the log of the body length plotted against the log of the volume of the structure. And you can see when we use all the data, like right up there in the figure on the top, um, it's positively, it's very significant, right? And it is positively allometric. When we look just at the juveniles, we see, again, it's significant and it's positively allometric, but there's no relationship in adults. There's no allometry in adults. 
Um, and again, this is not something that we uh, find in vertebrates, uh, in vertebrates at all. And when we look at the prepelvic tenaculum, exact same pattern. And you can see here there is a gap in this uh, regression up in the top where there are no intermediate points, right? And so um, uh, same thing with the intromitant claspers. And so we don't really find any intermediates of those shapes. It's like basically the males are going from like tiny tenaculum, tiny claspers, tiny prepelvic uh, tenacula to fully developed within just a, about a centimeter of one another. Um, and what's cool is that actually we found a paper where they had measured testis size in these guys back in the 60s, and you can see the pattern is exactly the same. So you have these males that like have tiny, tiny testes, and all of a sudden it's like a switch is flipped, and then now they have big testes and now they're ready to go. And this happens, uh, you know, uh, almost instantaneously. It's not like we missed any body size in our sampling. We have all the body sizes. It's just they literally go from nothing to all. Um, so we found significant ontogenetic allometry is strongly positive, significant allometry in juveniles, but not in adults. Like a switch is flipped and the juvenile structures become adult structures that do not grow very much. And again, super weird because we always find significant allometry in all the vertebrates that we looked at. And so you can imagine that uh, if we want to look at integration, as I said at the beginning, we, um, we are looking at two comparisons, right? So we want to know um, is development more important than function in these, um, uh, in these copulatory structures? If that's the case, then we would expect that the intromitant claspers and the prepelvic tenacula would be more tightly integrated with each other because they are together in the pelvic fin. Uh, whereas if function is more important, um, we would find that these uh, grasping structures, the frontal tenaculum and the prepelvic tenaculum, would be more integrated with each other. Um, but, of course, the next figure I'm going to show you should not be a surprise because I just show you that these things are like super tightly correlated within these classes, right? And so um, when we look at all of the data together, uh, they're significantly integrated, all of them with each other, because all of them are changing together at the same time. When we look at the effect size here, it would suggest that development is more important because um, uh, we find that... that uh, uh, it looks like the effect size there is, is um, uh, sort of more significant. But this, take this with a grain of salt because we're trying to figure out a better way to actually compare significant differences in effect sizes. Um, but it, it, is, it is pretty cool. Uh, when we look at integration within juveniles, no surprise, given everything that I just showed you, uh, this is actually expected. In juveniles, you wouldn't have integration because they're not mating yet, right? So they don't really need to do anything. But there's no integration within adults either. So... What the heck is going on? <laughs> um, uh, we don't know. I mean, these, these guys are weird. So we're finding these ontogenetic changes between juveniles and adults that are super significant. Uh, we find significant shape and size changes and significant, uh, significant ontogenetic integration. But we don't find the same when we're looking within juveniles and within adults. And that is very strange. Because it's basically like those males are almost like undergoing a metamorphosis, right? And so they really are more like insects than, than we had previously thought. Um, and so it might really be that for this fish, the function of all these three parts together um, might be more important than the specific morphological variation within each one of these components. Um, and what's interesting is the copulation is particularly tricky. And we think that what might be driving the system, these males that are essentially Velcro, right, because the males are attaching to the female with spines to whichever place in her body they can attach to, um, that, that this is because the females actually have Females, chim female chimeras are the only fish that actually have two separate vaginal openings. So they have lost their cloaca. And you can imagine that this, uh, for these bifurcated claspers to actually be positioned precisely to enter the female in these two vaginal openings is a, is, is a tricky proposition. The male really has to like be perfectly positioned there. And so this might be literally like natural selection for making copulation feasible in these fish. Um, and the fact that the variation in adults seems to be completely random uh, may indicate that there is no sexual selection operating in these structures. Um, okay, and so that's it. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Alrighty, hi everyone. My name is Rhiannon. I'm a third year PhD student from Monash University in Australia. Today I'm going to be talking to you about one of the chapters of my thesis, which is all about a unique form of parental investment called mouth brooding, and trying to understand how and why it has evolved in these cichlid fishes of Africa. 
So before I started, I wanted to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which I did this research. I'm honest, the Bunurong and Boonurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and of course extend that respect to any First Nations and Torres Strait Islander peoples that might be joining us at Evolution as well. So the relationship between a parent and their offspring is obviously really unique and complex, but also really important as well, not only at the individual level, but also for entire lineages of organisms. Parental investment takes on a whole bunch of different forms across the tree of life, from where the offspring develop, to how they get the nutrients, to ultimately who is the parent that is providing them with that really important care. And so parental investment can be relatively low cost to the parent in some instances, but it can also be uh, far more extreme. Some of the most extreme forms of parental care include internal incubation of eggs and embryos, in which the eggs and embryos are incubated inside the body of the parent. So they can include viviparity or pregnancy, in which eggs and embryos are incubated inside the reproductive system of the parent, and it can also include mouth brooding, in which eggs or embryos are incubated inside the mouth of those parents. And so recently, my team and I actually published a paper looking at the genomic basis of viviparity in a whole range of different vertebrates, which you can check out using the QR code up on the screen. But now I've sort of moved on to this newer project, which aims to look at the genomic basis of mouth brooding. So mouth brooding is a really widespread pattern of reproduction in the ray-finned fishes, and it's evolved independently around 11 times. So it's this really great example of convergent evolution. Despite it being largely confined to that one group of animals, it does look quite different depending on the species. So mouth breeding might differ, for example, in what parent does the mouth breeding, whether it's the male or the female, or sometimes it's both. It might also differ, for example, in what stage mouth breeding occurs at, whether it's just the eggs that are incubated, or maybe just the embryos. Again, sometimes it is both. And it is also really, really prominent in these cichlid fishes. So there's about 117 different genera of cichlids that undergo this one really complex form of parental investment. Of those 117 different genera of mouth brooding cichlids, 94% of them can be found in Africa. And so African cichlids are a particularly fascinating group of fishes because they are relatively young, but they're really, really phenotypically diverse. And so because they're so diverse, it means that uh, we as scientists are really interested in them. And so that's led to this massive effort to try and sequence and assemble pretty much as many cichlid genomes as is possible. And so that's been really good for me and good for other scientists as well, who are hoping to get to the molecular basis of these really complex traits, whether it be mouth breeding or uh, coloration or feeding morphology. Cichlids provide us with this really excellent model system to study the repeated evolution of these important biological traits. And so mouth brooding in the African cichlids is thought to have evolved from substrate guarding or substrate brooding in which the eggs are laid on different kinds of substrate such as uh, rocks and gravel. And so that transition has occurred at least four times. As you can imagine, in order for those transitions to have occurred, there are a lot of changes that need to take place. For example, to respiration, to the neural circuitry, and then also obviously to the cranial and the branchial morphology of those fissures. So we do know a fair bit about the physiological and the morphological aspects of mouth brooding, but we don't know all that much about the molecular basis of its repeated evolution in these fishes. Luckily though, the increasing availability of genomic data now is providing us with this opportunity to explore that and find out what's going on at the molecular level that's facilitating these transitions away from laying eggs on substrate and towards keeping eggs within the mouth of those parents. And so the aim of this chapter of my PhD is to investigate the genomic origins of mouth brooding in these African cichlids. Specifically, I wanted to find out what changes might be occurring to the genomes of these cichlids. I wanted to find out where these changes might be occurring, so to the coding or the non-coding parts of genes, so introns and untranslated regions. And then what, also what is the nature of those changes? So are these changes occurring to the same or similar parts of the genome in these mouth brooders? or are they occurring in completely different parts of the genome depending on the species? And so to answer those three questions, I utilised comparative genomics, which as most of you know, is a really great tool to try and figure out what's happened to the genomes of those mouth breeding cichlids that has afforded them this ability to be able to invest in their offspring in such a complex way. And so we started off this project by generating our data set and choosing the species that we wanted to work with. So we chose genomes belonging to five different mouth breeding cichlids. And then for each of those five mouth breeders, I then paired them up with a closely related substrate brooder. 
And so that way each of those pairs could then represent one transition towards mouth breeding. So overall, we had a data set comprising of 12 African cichlid genomes, uh, accounting for all four of those independent transitions towards mouth breeding. So what I did with, with those genomes was align them to one another to find regions of the genome that were shared between all 12 of those species so that I could then look at how they differed between the mouth brooders and the substrate brooders. So I generated this multiple genome alignment and I found just over 27,000 coding regions and over 600,000 non-coding regions that were conserved across all of those species. Starting off with the coding regions, one of the things that I was interested in looking at was whether any of these sequences could be under some sort of selective pressure in the mouth brooders and whether that could then potentially drive the evolution of this trait. In particular, we were looking at uh, trying to find evidence of positive selection in the mouth brooders, which in this case is when you've got more advantageous changes to amino acids than you do synonymous mutations. Uh, and so just to illustrate, let's say we take a random coding region of the genome, we've got the nucleotide sequence for three different individuals, as well as the amino acid sequence for those three individuals as well. If we look at the second individual compared to the first individual, which we might say is like the consensus, we can see that there's been a change in the nucleotide sequence, but that hasn't led to a change in the amino acid sequence, and so we would call this kind of mutation synonymous. If we look at the last individual again, you can see that there's been a change in the nucleotide sequence, but this time it has led to a change in the amino acid sequence, and so this type of mutation we would call non-synonymous. And so when we look for evidence of positive selection, we're essentially looking for regions of the genome that experience higher rates of these non-synonymous mutations compared to the synonymous mutations. And so I looked for evidence of positive selection using three different methods. The first one looked at positive selection on sites in the mouth brooders. The second one looked at positive selection on the entire gene among the mouth brooders. And then the last one looked at selection on a proportion of those sites for the mouth brooders. So when I looked at those results, I found 80 sequences in which the sites were selected, 24 in which the entire gene was selected, and then 91 in which a proportion of those sites were selected for the mouth brooders with the p-values adjusted as well. And so ultimately, that's showing us that there is this really strong evidence to suggest that positive selection is occurring in these mouth brooding cichlids and that these changes are convergent as well because they're happening exclusively in these mouth brooding lineages and to multiple mouth brooders for the one sequence as well. And so if we take a step back now, looking at that entire gene again, I also wanted to know what was going on in those non-coding regions, so the, um, the UTRs and the introns. So specifically, I wanted to find out whether any of these sequences could be evolving faster in these mouth brooding cichlids. So of the over 600,000 non-coding sequences that we were working with, I found just over 5,000 that were evolving faster exclusively in those mouth brooding cichlids. Of those 5,000 accelerated elements, I wanted to test for evidence of convergent acceleration which is essentially where you've got the same bit of DNA evolving faster in multiple different mouth brooders at once. And so an example of that is shown up here, where this tree is modelled off of just a random non-coding region of the genome. And so those branch lengths correspond to the rate of evolution of that sequence for a particular species. And so the longer the branch and the redder the branch, the faster that sequence is evolving for that species. And so in this instance, it's evolving faster in Tylochromus and in Bonitochromus, so two different mouth brooding species. So we call it convergently accelerated. And so we found 666 different regions showing this pattern of convergent acceleration. And so ultimately that's suggesting to us that evolution may indeed be targeting the same parts of the genome in these mouth brooding cichlids. We also wanted to test for evidence of universal acceleration, where again, you've got the same sequence evolving faster, but this time in every single mouth brooder in our data set. And so exciting, we found just one sequence showing this pattern of universal acceleration, where you can see that it's accelerated in every single mouth brooder in our data set. And so this particular sequence was actually located in Nectin-like 2, and so the protein of which is an adhesion molecule that's important in sinus formation and in spermatogenesis. So our strongest signature of convergence here is with the acceleration of a sequence that's important in the nervous system and also in the reproductive system as well. 
And so to tie it all together, how have we got such a complex form of parental investment evolved time and time again in these really unique African fishes? By using comparative genomics, we were able to show that that transition towards mouth brooding might be accompanied by convergent amino acid changes, so with positive selection, with the acceleration of non-coding parts of genes, with changes that occur in completely unique parts of the genome, but also changes that are happening in the exact same parts of the genome as well. And so ultimately, we've found that the convergence of this really complex trait might be underlied by convergence at the molecular level, particularly to different parts of genes as well. And so I think that if we can now move forward using comparative genomics and accounting for a whole bunch of these different evolutionary relationships, we can get really, really close to identifying the molecular <laughs> mechanisms that are driving the evolution of these complex forms of parental care. So I'll finish off by thanking my supervisors, Bob Wong and Matt McGee, everyone else in the Wong and McGee Labs at Monash Uni, and of course, everyone else for listening here today. Thank you so much. Um, hi, I'm Samantha Traim. I'm a PhD student in Ron Bonnet's lab at the University of Tulsa. Uh, and I'm very happy to talk to you today about the variation in the external nasal gland morphology across the family of salamanders Plethodonidae. Uh, but first, I would like to talk about courtship rituals. Uh, there are many intricate courtship rituals across the animal kingdom. We know of the jumping peacock spider and the birds of paradise just as a few examples of these very intricate rituals. Uh, what we also seem to happen is there's a male bias point of view, typically from these rituals, where a more passive role is given to the females rather than uh, the active role that are maintained in the males. Uh, and so no exception to this is the family of Plethodonidae. They do have an incredibly intricate courtship ritual, uh, and they're Two main morphological characters that differentiate them from other salamanders are their lunglessness and their nasal labial grooves, but today I'd like to focus on these three characteristics. They are incredibly species rich. Uh, to basically give you an idea of this, they have 516 species spread across these 28 genera, uh, and the closest to this in the family, or in salamanders, salamanders is the family Salamandridae, uh, which is about 140 species of across 21 genera. Uh, so they are incredibly species rich for salamanders. <laughs> uh, and they also have an incredible variation in life history in that they exhibit three life history modes. So we have the classic metamorphosis mode in which you can think of a classic tadpole to metamorphosing into a frog. And then we also have a pedamorphosis uh, life history mode in which they just maintain their larval characteristics throughout their entire life, which you can kind of see in the uh, brown guy in the middle of the screen. Uh, they also have direct development, uh, which they hatch from the egg as miniature adults and just grow into their sexual maturity as they age. They also have an incredible diversity in habitat in which they are found in streams, under leaf litter, uh, logs, rock crevices, caves. Uh, there's actually a salamander that's on the edge of a desert, <laughs> so uh, that's pretty cool. So they do have uh, a great variation in their lives. But for their courtship ritual, it's mostly, uh, or it's split up into five modules or stages. The first one is approach, in which the male will continue to approach the female uh, until she stops moving, typically, at which point they move into head contact, which you can see here, uh, where the number two flashed up, where they will, uh, the male will rub his cheeks and his chin over her nares, uh, basically until she is uh, until they are ready to move on to the next stage, which is the tail straddle walk, which is the main, uh, like the well-known portion of this courtship ritual, uh, which you can see uh, where the number three is flashed up. Uh, there's actually two portions of it I have uh, highlighted here. Number three is the classic tail straddle walk where the female is just straddling the male's tail. Uh, there are points in some courtship rituals in some of the genera uh, where the male will actually turn around and rub his chin on her nares, sometimes even biting or pulling at her, uh, drawing blood. They then move on to number four, which is finally the last picture on the right of the screen, uh, where you can see that white packet is the spermatophore. Uh, it's basically just his packet of sperm that he has left for her as they move forward in the tail, tail straddle walk. Uh, before they finally uh, move on to positioning where the female will position her cloaca over the spermatophore, picking it up. 
During this courtship ritual, I mentioned a lot of head rubbing, uh, specifically uh, with his chin. Uh, they have a well-known courtship gland called the mental gland, which experiences periods of atrophy and uh, hypertrophy, which is just a swelling, basically, during the mating season. Uh, we know that these glands uh, are typically just sexually dimorphic glands and that they are only found in male salamanders. Uh, so they... Uh, Females are not present. They have been induced previously, but only through uh, the exposure of testosterone. But these courtship glands are typically producing pheromones, uh, which in salamanders uh, increase the receptivity of the female and are typically proteinaceous molecules. Uh, they're usually also secreted as cocktails from these three different gene families of SPF, PRF, and PMF. Uh, which, as you can see, based on this phylogeny, they uh, actually do become lost in some pedomorphic species. And today, I would actually just like for you to remember SPF, if you would. It will come up later. Uh, but today, I'm talking about the external nasal gland, uh, which was originally described in 1876 uh, in a very German uh, paper that took me a very long time to find uh, by a name, uh, uh, Widersham. Uh, he basically just drew the gland as extending from the external nares uh, and touching the orbit of the eyes of the salamanders. So uh, it was then described again in 1906 by Inez Whipple Wilder. Uh, she named it nasal labial gland one t originally, and again has it going from the external nares, touching the orbit in the salamander. She later renamed it the external nasal gland in 1925. Some people uh, skipped over it. Uh, one such person was uh, David Siever. When he examined this gland, he stopped in front of the orbit because he thought that's where the gland mass was. And what he found uh, in both males and female salamanders is that this gland didn't produce anything. There was nothing in the lumen. There was no cell change, nothing at all. So he said, it's just there. It's probably just a nasal labial gland, you know. Uh, and then in 2022, <laughs> uh, I published uh, my master's thesis. My advisor had found the gland again uh, in males and females and noticed a change in it. And so we decided to take a look over the seasonality of this gland and determine, wanted to determine if it did actually do nothing. <laughs> Uh, so what we found was that there actually wasn't a lot of change. We measured the epithelial height and tubular diameter across males and females from an entire year, and there actually wasn't a lot of change. Uh, so they actually didn't swell at all. There, was no hyper there wasn't a lot of hypertrophy, especially when you compare the uh, graphs in the upper right corner. In comparison to the mental gland, it's really not changing that much. But it does react positively to a periodic acid shifts reaction and an alcyon or really a blue stain, which both uh, stain four proteins. So this gland is producing proteins. Fun. Uh, we then did some more uh, TEM on this gland, and what we found is that it has an abundance of rough endoplasmic reticulum packaging proteins. Uh, and we also found a density of secretory granules in the gland itself. Uh, some of them actually about to be secreted in the picture all the way to the right. Uh, it's about to go into the lumen. Sometimes these granules are actually so dense that half the gland wouldn't stain, <laughs> which was a little bit concerning. <laughs> Uh, but with my current work, I've actually found some preliminary transcriptomic uh, data recently that I did uh, where it, there are two uh, pheromone genes uh, that are expressed in this gland. Uh, I've only done mating males so far, uh, so I'm really hoping to get more females, but it seems likely this is a courtship pheromone producing gland. Uh, interestingly, these two genes are only, or yeah, are only secreted typically in the caudal gland, which is another courtship pheromone gland in salamanders. Uh, they are typically not found in the mental gland. So despite their close proximity, they don't really secrete the same thing, which is also another interesting trait. But for what I'm doing now, I'm currently collecting a plethora of species uh, and examining light microscopy slides. Basically, I'm sectioning from the tip of the snout to behind the eye, which you can see the gland uh, is that white, bright spot <laughs> right behind the eye, which is why tip, no one had found it to do anything previously, because they weren't going far enough. Uh, and my plan was to track the gland throughout these slides and determine some different characteristics and then use this to make an ancestral state reconstruction. 
So uh, these are my characters that I've used so far. Uh, a is just anterior to the eye. How far does the gland actually go back towards the eye? Um, M is mid-eye, P posterior. And then some of them have a weird thing where it actually projects past the external nares. Uh, the, just the convolutions go past it for some reason. And then a couple of the salamanders actually exhibit an ipsilateral joining, which is just fancy for they meet in the middle, uh, which is weird. <laughs> Uh, so what I've found so far, uh, I do have 30 species of plethodonids with an outgroup of Riacotriton. I do hope to get an Amphiuma to serve as an outgroup. However, I just got my hands on one, and it is a little bit scary to decalcify. <laughs> Uh, so, so far, what we found is that all the blue dots you see are absents, and those are all pedomorphic species. Typical pedomorphic species, not really a lot of pheromones being produced there. Uh, another interesting character is that a lot of the biphasic salamanders have the gland going posterior to the eye, uh, whereas a lot of the direct developers have it going, stopping anterior, with the exception of three of the Desmognathus species, Basically, uh, these are biphasic salamanders that are nested within direct developers, and so they actually exhibit the direct developing characteristics, uh, except for the actual Desmognathus that are direct developers going to the mid-eye <laughs> because of, they wanted to be different, I guess. <laughs> Uh, we also have the Plethodon serratus and uh, Oedipina cyclicata are direct developers, and they also exhibit this posterior uh, expansion past the eye. Uh, and then with the anterior projection, what we found so far is that uh, most of the direct developers have it, whereas most of the biphasics do not, <laughs> with the exception of Eurycia bragi and Eurycia spilea, both cave species. <laughs> uh, and if I just go back to the slide, you'll notice that they also have the posterior uh, er, uh, expansion past the eye, so it seems as though they're maximizing the space that this gland gets inside their head. I do hope to measure this and actually quantify it in a uh, more solid fashion. Uh, and then once we move on, the ipsilateral joining is found in two lone salamanders <laughs> uh, that I've done so far, uh, just Polytoglossa subpalmata and Betrachoseps attenuatus. Uh, from what I've read on these salamanders, because I haven't seen a live one yet, <laughs> is that their snout is uh, smaller typically than most other plethodontid sal salamanders. So perhaps they are just trying to maximize the space that they give to this gland or maintain its presence. Uh, because based on my ancestral state reconstructions, this was present in the uh, ancestor to plethodontids. So, so far, uh, with my conclusions and implications, it was, again, likely present in the ancestor to these salamanders, and it is likely producing these courtship pheromones also possibly in female salamanders. Uh, and this would be the first comparative study to actually use female salamanders to compare courtship glands, at least in Plethodonidae, uh, as most <laughs> comparative studies have just been on the mental gland found only in males. So, it's very exciting. At least I think so. <laughs> uh, my future directions, I would like to collect more museum specimens for histology. I actually recently was awarded the Collection Studies Grant by the American uh, Natural History Museum. So I do get to go there and see my first dendrotriton. <laughs> uh, and I do plan on running more transcriptomics on males and females as soon as I get back to Tulsa, <laughs> as well as finding possible homologs based on historical literature, which is part of the reason why I've waited uh, to do the Amphiuma Day. There have been mentions of it in Amphiuma Day as well as Salamandra Day uh, throughout, uh, well, from 1860 to 1920 it was mentioned. <laughs> uh, so I'm very excited to look into it more. And then with that, I would like to acknowledge my lab. Uh, they have been very helpful to me, as well as my master's lab. Uh, they still continue to help me, and as well as the Amer American Museum of Natural History for giving me money. <laughs> so, and with that, I'd like to take your questions. Hi, everyone. We are going from, I guess, vertebrates to invertebrates, and we're going to the Caribbean. And so my talk is going to be about the speciation in corals across depths. And, you know, there are beautiful ecosystems, but we know very little about the species, how they form in the ocean. And the work that we are going to, that I'm going to present today is related to work of two PhD students in my lab, Matias Gomez and Taylor Lindsay. 
mostly about Matias. The work that you're going to see is mostly about uh, Matias' work. <clears throat> and, you know, if we talk about the speciation, it is kind of needed to mention that allopatry is kind of the main, you know, the traditional view in which a species form. And that has happened in the ocean, at least uh, to me. One of the most vivid examples of that is the rise of the Isthmus of Panama. So that divided populations from the Eastern Caribbean, Eastern Pacific, and the Caribbean, and that produced probably thousands of species on either side of the Isthmus. And if you read the work of Nancy Knowlton and, uh, you know, major giants like them, they have worked uh, in many of these pairs. So that has happened in the ocean, but for the most part, the ocean looks something like this. There are not too many barriers, <laughs> and, but there are probably millions of species. For a large portion of that biodiversity, they also have a long planktonic larval dispersal, and having no barriers and long planktonic larval dispersal hinders population differentiation and the formation of a species. However, if you zoom or you dive into the ocean and go to, into a coral reef, coral reefs are one of the most stratified ecosystems on Earth. You can go from, a, you know, the back reef on a coral reef into the deep fall reef, and there are major changes in a species composition that occur across that uh, length. And going from the back reef to the fall reef in a regular fringing reef doesn't... Uh, take you more than a couple hundred meters. So all that change occur in a tiny, a small, a spatial scale. And so larvae from any of those, you know, from any of those places can go into the other place. So everything is in a mixture, but once they are adults, they are highly stratified. And one of the major factors in that stratification seem to be light. Light is a major, uh, you know, light decreases exponentially in the water column, and light, for instance, in deeper environments only receives about 5% of the light that shallow waters would receive. So it's a major change for corals, and, cor and light for corals is critical because they live in a tight association, intracellular association with a tiny symbiotic algae that does photosynthesis, and, uh, you know, there is a polyp there, and the shades of uh, brown are... Uh, algae. And so they have millions of these algae doing photosynthesis. They produce a lot of energy for the coral. So that's, you know, that needs to work very well so that the coral survives. But also too much light is a problem. So the coral is in an intermediate state. If it's too much light, it produces light stress. If it's too little light, then it, you have light limitation. And the coral is kind of fine-tuning the calyces and the shape of the coral to be in a happy medium. And recently, our lab has been working with the Orbicella, or the Orbicella fabiolata species. And the first thing that we did was to go across a, a Caribbean reef. This is in Puerto Rico, and this is whole genome data. What you see is that you have two main clusters. You have a red cluster, which is usually associated with shallow waters, and a blue cluster, which is usually associated with deep, deeper waters. If you go to the mid layer of the depth gradient, <clears throat> what you see is the two, the shallow and the deep, but they never mix. They don't form like a classical climb or a hybrid zone. They have you have either one or the other. You have a mixture of the two, but you have fully one or fully the other. You don't have these hybrids. And to me, this suggests that they are actually a species. They are coexisting in the same habitat. They are within crossing range of each other. They are usually living side by side in mid depths. And so to me, that seems like a, a perfect example of a species. And we have made a few reconstructions. This is for Orbicella fabiolata. Usually these radiations or splits between shallow and deep are very recent. And we have done these reconstructions for, I think, Pocilopora damicornis, Leunicia flexosa, uh, Agaricia garicitis. And usually it's no longer than about 500,000 years. And usually that involves some gene flow in the evolution of those uh, lineages. The lineages, we have also been interested a little bit on the functionality of that divergence, what is changing. 
And one of the major things that we have noticed is that calices are changing. It looks like calices are getting wider as you go deeper into the ocean, and there is also fewer of them. And so here you have, for instance, a cross depth, and there is a major increase in calis uh, size, and also a major decrease in calis density as you go deeper. And that makes sense because in shallow waters, what we think, or the hypothesis that we work with, is that uh, in shallow waters you have a longer and, and uh, narrower calices to shade from light, and in deeper environments you have wider, more shallow calices, and also it's more spread among them, so they don't shade each other. If you have too many calices, one shades the other. And in deep depths, they need to maximize the light that, they, that is the incoming light. When I did my PhD, I never thought this was going to be so uh, common on corals. But now, we, if, the, on the left, you have the phylogeny of the anthozoans. And these are different cases in which people, researchers, have usually found cryptic lineages in corals. And once they have found cryptic lineages, usually the major axis of differentiation is that. And so you can see many of them. Uh, we counted them in about at least 24 genera. We have seen that transitioning. And so the question is, what is producing dep these depth-segregated lineages across the ocean? And the other aspect is that that happens also across many oceans, you know, in the Red Sea, in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, in the Eastern Pacific, many places across the world. And so what is uh, producing them? And here we have to come back to light. Light is not only important for the metabolism of these corals, this is also critical for many aspects of the biology of the corals, including spawning. And spawning is the major factor, or we think is a major factor in reproductive isolation of these corals. So the work of Nancy Norton and Don Levington has shown that Orbicella, in sister lineages of the one that, we, that I just presented, uh, or be corals in deeper environments spawn at least two hours before the corals in shallow waters. So that means uh, deeper corals are perceiving sunset and moonlight much earlier than shallow water corals. And that generates a very strong mechanism for reproductive isolation. And so then the question is, okay, what are the things that are changing between these depth segregating lineages? For most part of the genome, they are very homogeneous. You know, there is probably a lot of gene flow or there hasn't been enough time to differentiate. But there are certain aspects that are important in that differentiation. The most divergent genes are G-protein coupled receptors. And in, you know, I never knew what are G-protein coupled receptors, but they are opsin genes. A lot of them are opsin genes, so they are related to light. And Rosenberg, uh, not too long ago, pro provided this model because spawn, you know, finding the mechan molecular mechanisms of spawning has been studied in the past in, in acroporids. And people have come up with this model. So what you're seeing here is the model that they developed for spawning. And in red, you're seeing all these G-protein coupled receptors or the genes that we're seeing highly divergent between depth segregated lineages in Orbicella fabulata. The hypothesis that we have is that the rhodopsins are on the surface of the cells. They are capturing environmental signals that are changing. They are signaling the camodulin and the glutamate pathway. They are opening channels that are connecting the cell from extracellular to intracellularly. There is a major change in calcium from outside to inside, that produces a lot of uh, movement internally in the cell, cell cycle, cell movement, and muscle activation, and that uh, provides the spawning. That's at least the, our best estimate of what is happening. And not only that, uh, those genes are, are actually under a strong selection. So we use, we assume an heterozygous disadvantage model and apply Klein theory on the frequencies of those genes. And we calculated that about 8% per locus selection is happening in those genes. And on top of that, 
there is the NDS ratios in, in at least a handful of these genes. So what you're seeing on the y-axis is DN, non-synonymous substitutions. On the, y, on the x-axis, synonymous substitutions. The, the, the black bar is indicating, you know, the closer it is to the DN, uh, the more selection is happening. And so the, the black bar is showing you the one, the ratio of one, and so the, the genes on, on black, the black dots, are showing all those handful of genes that are under positive selection according to the DNDS ratio. So what we think is that opsins like genes, G-protein coupled receptors, are a major factor involved in the differentiation of timing of exponent and are actually probably the ones that are driving this reproductive isolation in depth segregated corals. And I invite you all to look in your data sets because I feel that this is a very important aspect of these corals. And with that, I think I had the gratitude or the fortune to work with uh, giants in the field. So Nancy Knowlton and Don Levington provided most of the spawning stuff. Uh, I didn't talk about the physiology of the corals, but the physiology is also changing and you guess that the different calices and all that produce very different levels of photosynthesis and also heat stress response, and also Monica Medina. And with that, I take questions.